So, a very good day to one and all. I am Dr. Rohit Gopinath. So, today we will be discussing about salivary glands. So, let us begin with the anatomy of the salivary glands. Now, it is very important to know that we have three major salivary glands in the body and more than 800 minor salivary glands located in various locations in the head and neck region. So, the three major salivary glands are the parotid, the submandibular gland and the sublingual gland. Now, it is very important that we have an intricate knowledge regarding the anatomy of at least these three major salivary glands because the surgical management of most of the pathologies involving these three glands are inherently dependent upon the dependent upon a thorough knowledge of the local anatomy. So, otherwise anatomy plays a very important role in surgery more so in head and neck surgery and even more so in parotid surgery or parotid in general or uh, in salivary gland surgery. Now, let us first discuss about the anatomy of the parotid gland. Now, the parotid gland is nothing but parotid or parotic which means it is located in and around the ear. So, it is the largest of the salivary glands and it is enclosed by a thick parotid capsule. This parotid capsule is formed by the deep cervical fascia which splits to encase the parotid gland. It is very important to note that the anterior sheet of this deep cervical fascia which forms the parotid capsule is very much adherent to the parotid gland compared to the posterior sheet. This is very important with regard to certain pathologies involving the parotid gland. Now, the parotid itself is located deep to the parotid fascia and superficial to the masseter. Now, because it is located deep to the parotid fascia, you find that on opening or on clenching the teeth, you find on clenching the teeth, you find the parotid swelling becomes more prominent, whereas on opening the mouth, which stretches the parotid fascia, the parotid swelling remains less prominent. Even though it is theoretically, we say all these, then it might be very difficult to make out an increase or decrease in size of the parotid swelling with the uh, clenching of teeth and opening of the mouth. But then theoretically, yes, when you have an op when you open a mouth wide, it stretches the parotid fascia. So, whatever swelling is underneath the parotid fascia, that is basically a parotid swelling, becomes less apparent. And on clenching the tooth, when you contract the masseter muscle, it pushes the parotid forward, makes it more apparent. The parotid plant has a superficial and a deep layer. Now, this designation of a parotid or this demarcation of the parotid into a superficial and a deep layer is based on the fascio venous plane of patty, which mainly has the facial nerve in it. So, you find that this deep and superficial parts are very important because of their relation to the adjacent structures. So, the superficial part is located very closely related to the ramus of the mandible, closely related to the ramus of the mandible, whereas the deep portion is located deep to the mandible, more cl closer related to the posterior aspect of the mandible, it is very closely related to the parapharyngeal space, etc. So, this is very important because certain lesions involving the leap lobe may not be very apparent from the external point of view. In fact, certain lesions involving the superficial lobe are become apparent very quickly, whereas deep lobe lesions may not become apparent because they tend to grow inwards rather than outwards. So, this understanding regarding what divides a parotid plant into these two parts and how the, ex the extent or grow is very important. You can also have what is called as an accessory parotid gland, which is located as an outward extension of the parotid gland itself in close relation to the parotid duct. Coming on to the parotid duct. Now, the parotid duct is the largest among the three major salivary glands. So, this duct is around 3 to 5 millimeters in diameter and it starts off from the anterior aspect of the parotid gland and drains into the oral cavity just opposite to the crown of the second upper second molar tooth. During its course from the parotid to the oral cavity, it tends to go over the masseter muscle, penetrates the buccinator muscle, buccopharyngeal fascia, buccal pad of fat and then opens into the oral cavity. And like I said earlier, it opens into the oral cavity via the parotid papilla, which is located just opposite to the crown of the upper second molar tooth. Now, parotid duct is actually bidigitally palpable. You find that it can be palpated over the masseter muscle. Anatomical landmark 
to identify the course of the parotid duct is usually taken as an arbitrary line drawn from the tragus right to the mid portion of the upper lip. So, if you draw a straight line across that more or less the middle one third, one fourth of these, uh, this line corresponds to the course of the parotid duct. And when you bi digitally want to palpate the parotid duct to look for any calculi, etc., you can palpate it one finger breadth by using the two fingers, basically the index finger and the thumb, wherein the index finger can be placed within the oral cavity and the thumb can be placed outside the oral cavity over the cheek. So, the thumb is placed one finger breadth below the zygomatic and the index finger is placed within the oral cavity and both that using both these digits, we can palpate the uh, parotid duct against the masseter muscle. So, you can palpate it as a cord like structure against the masseter muscle. So, this is used when you want to examine for the presence of any stones involving the parotid duct. Now, it is easier said than done because you are likely to lose your finger if you try to palpate uh, the parotid duct, but then again, theoretically, it is possible to do so. It is imperative that we discuss about the facial nerve when we discuss about parotid gland. Now, facial nerve is the single most important nerve which is related to the parotid gland. Now, facial nerve begins in the pons wherein it begins as a sensory and a motor root. This sensory and the motor root enters through the internal acoustic meatus into the temporal petrous part of the temporal bone. Of course, within the petrous part of the temporal bone, it enters into what is called as the facial canal. In the facial canal, it is very important that three, we understand the three important things that happen inside. One is that it has a course which is like a lazy S, Z shape, you can say. So, this is the Z. So, this course of the facial nerve within the facial canal is very important. 